Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is the one, this is one that people have kind of been waiting for because it's a film I haven't seen before and it's considered to be a classic for big time horror nerds. Um, this one's been on my list for a long time and I finally, finally, finally got to it. I don't have any good excuses as to why it took so long, but finally some people can stop uh, pushing me on this one because I did it. I did it. And here's my review on this. And I'm going to let you know, I broke it down so that I'm going to talk about each individual story and then give a rating for each of the stories. And then at the end, give an overall rating and talk a little bit about that too. So breaking it down on this one. Obviously from 1982, Creep Show, directed by George A. Romero. Now this was after he had done Night Riders and before he did Day of the Dead, just to give you a reference for where he was in his film career at this point. Um, this was written by Stephen King. Now, take note that Stephen King has not written a lot of feature-length screenplays in his life, so it's kind of rare that he did it for this one. The other ones that he's done, uh, a few a few of them were actually TV shows that I put in there because it's significant amount of script writing. Rose Red that was on TV, Storm of the Century was also a TV show, then Sleepwalkers and Cat's Eye, which Cat's Eye is also an anthology film, which I watched some years ago, and I remember enjoying enough. Uh, I think Creepshow is obviously better, which I'm sure a lot of people would probably agree with me on that. Although, if you don't, you can go ahead and put it in the comments. Let me know why. Now, this was the only George A. Romero film to open number one at the box office the week it came out. That is sad because Romero was such a wonderful filmmaker who actually felt that a lot of people didn't really even care about his material I was actually just reading an article in Room Morgue about that, so it's really sad to hear that he felt like people didn't appreciate him as much as they probably should have, and it was probably because of stuff like this, the fact that Creepshow was the only thing that hit number one in the box office when he put it out. So, sucks, but it's worth noting that for this. Now, reportedly, well, I'm going to give you some backstory on some other things about this, you know, kind of interesting things trivia-wise that I found out about the film. But there is so much out there about this, so if you want to know more, I would say, you know, go to IMDb and read their trivia stuff there. There's also plenty of other places you can find information. But I just pulled out a few choice bits of information that I thought were interesting. Leslie Nielsen, who did a wonderful job in this, by the way, in a pretty much straight role. Uh, he usually does comedy stuff, obviously, or did. Uh, he reportedly, in between takes, had a fart machine on on set that he would use to crack people up, and there were many times where he would use it right before they were about to start a scene, so that it would kind of mess people up and they'd have to try and recompose themselves before the filming started. It was uh, just a funny story. I, I bet that was a good time to be on set with him. The cockroaches in this, in the final story, uh, apparently cost 50 cents a piece, which if you I, I was going to say, take if you take stock, you can't take stock of how many roaches were in it because they're an insane amount, especially in that final, like, explosion of roaches out of Ups and Pratt. Uh, yeah, you can't, you can't do it. So apparently that was the most expensive aspect of the film, like the one most expensive thing, were purchasing all these cockroaches because it was 50 cents per cockroach. And you got to think, that's 50 cents back in 1982. I wonder what the adjustment on that is for inflation nowadays. I got to think over a buck a piece to put it in perspective. That's just me spitballing. So I don't know for sure, but I'm sure someone could look that up. Now, apparently the marble ashtray that first shows up in the very first story, I'm not counting the kind of like overall story that ties them all together because I'm not reviewing that one because it's barely a story really. Um, it's just very quick. But uh, the marble ashtray that shows up in that first story apparently has a very small appearance in every single one of the stories. That's the only thing that's in every single story. Now, maybe you want to go back and watch it and look for that. Just an interesting bit of information. Now, we all know about Fluffy. Fluffy is the creature that was in the crate in the crate ep uh, story. But that was Tom Savini who, who created Fluffy, and that was actually Tom Savini's very first time creating an animatronic creature. Now, in order to get the information on that and figure out how to go about it and perfect his technique on it, he apparently spent a lot of time on the phone with Rob Bottin, obviously best known for his work on The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing. So uh, a guy of wonderful uh, 
uh, practical effects pedigree. So I just thought that was interesting that he got those pointers from Rob Bottin. The crew used for the shoot of this film actually went on to then work together again on another film that some people may have a place in their heart for, which I do, which is Sleepaway Camp. The same crew for Creepshow did Sleepaway Camp. Kind of cool, even though Romero and King obviously not tied to that one. This film ended up touching off an anthology film fad, but it actually ended up remaining the most successful of any anthology films that came after it. So, I mean, you can see why, and I would think that especially for anthology not being as big of a thing, and then they come out with this Creepshow anthology, uh, I could see where people were just kind of wowed by it, because it it's not a new concept, because anthology's been done before, but if enough time passes and something hasn't really been used a whole lot in film, and then all of a sudden someone's doing it again. It feels new to people. And then, like I said, it touched off that fad. I get the whole taboo horror material theme in the beginning of the film. Uh, I actually had that in my young life. You know, that I'm talking about when Tommy Atkins' character is grabbing the comic book from Joe Hill. That was Joe Hill, um, Stephen King's son, who played that character. Um... And I feel that because in my house when I was growing up, when I was younger, I wasn't allowed to see things that were horror related, you know, it was stay away from that. That's not good for you. I know plenty of people now who grew up with no such uh, restrictions and it makes me kind of wish that I hadn't missed out on so much back then horror wise, but I'm trying to get caught up now. That's one of the reasons I hadn't seen Creepshow until now. So I kind of related to the opening of that. And I'm sure there are other people who relate to that too. I like how Stan references their stories you'll see as he rails against the comic he threw out. Tom Atkins' character, Stan, he literally is like running through talking about the garbage that's in the comic book that he's just confiscated from his son. And if you listen, he literally talks about in brief summarization each of the stories that you'll end up seeing throughout the film. Uh, I thought that was kind of like a cool, I don't want to say foreshadowing, but a cool kind of teaser for what's coming. The creep himself looks excellent, and the switch that they do then to animation in the opening credits also looks really cool. Great animation in this. Uh, and finally seeing this film, I obviously see a lot more tie-ins to the creep show series that's been on Shudder, which, by the way, if you have interest, I have reviews for every single episode of the creep show uh, that's been on Shutter, including the special episodes. So you can check that out on my channel. There's an entire playlist just for that, which I think I'm going to put this in there too. So let's start talking about the first story, Father's Day. This one's relatively short. I was kind of expecting and kind of wanting a little bit more out of it, especially when you get the, uh, well, when you experience the other ones and how they're significantly longer, some of them. So when Sylvia tells Hank that the three of them will sit down to dinner, and then she corrects herself and says the four, I had the idea that she was meaning that something was going to happen to Hank. Obviously, that didn't end up happening, but that kind of made that indicator to me. But in the end, there are just three to enjoy the cake. Uh, and the cake is probably the best part of the of the story. Obviously, I, I'm assuming it is supposed to be because of the shocking reveal of it, because the dead man, uh, Nathan, I forget his last name, I ever, uh, Grantham, just wants his cake. He just keeps talking about wanting his cake, which I think is hilarious. So it like plays as like, scary and creepy because obviously he's coming back from the dead, but the fact that he just keeps saying cake, cake, I want my cake, where's my cake? Uh, it adds that kind of light humorous factor to it, which obviously this film has a lot of that. Like, that's what they were going for. They were trying to make it scary and creepy, but also have plenty of humor in it to keep it light and fun. And it's a good mix. It really is. So when Aunt Bedelia is talking at the grave and the hand pops right out in the in front of the camera, it's kind of like this pop where it's just like this. Um, that's I didn't do it nearly as well. Let me see. If, it's still not good. But anyway, the way they pulled that off was really cool. I didn't see it coming. That's a legitimately good jump scare, which a lot of films have done terrible jump scares. They were just like, oh, okay, whatever. That one was a good one because I didn't see it coming. And the fact that they do it so close up in the camera, it's even more kind of, you know, makes you, takes you aback as an audience member because it's like it's coming at you 
in a sense. It works. Not sure why you would lie still while a big piece of rock is inching closer to your falling on your head. That's talking about uh, hair, uh, Hank. Sorry. There were a lot of H's in this. There was like a Henry, a Harry, and a Hank. I wonder if there's something to that. I don't, I don't know. But um, Ed uh, Harris's character, Hank. Sorry. Getting confused again with these H's. The fact that he's like laying on the grave and he's just watching this headstone just like inch towards falling on his head and the fact that he just lays there like that kind of was ridiculous to me that was too over the top. I think you should have tried to move and then maybe it you know hits him a little bit faster. So that was one thing I didn't really like because why would he just lay there? I guess you could give the reasoning that he was like stunned with shock and terror like he just couldn't move he was so scared. Sure but I don't know, it didn't play that well for me. I do love that Grantham just keeps wanting his cake, and the even better that he makes the cake out of Sylvia's head. Love that. I'm sure that's everyone's favorite part of that particular story. And it does seem to play with the idea that you can't truly ever get away from your own flesh and blood, because it seems that the whole family had moved on from Nathan Grant, uh, Grantham, but he had not moved on from them. He will come back. He will celebrate that birthday. He is going to reclaim what is his, and you just can't get away from your own flesh and blood, no matter how much you want and how much you have tried to kill them, which Aunt Bedelia did kill him, or how much you try to forget about him and you tell these stories that he's gone and dead and buried, he comes back. And I think that was kind of meant to be the subtext of this, is that you can't ever truly get away from your past, truly get away from your family members and your ties to your family. And probably genetics for that reason. So anyway, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm giving the story Father's Day a three-star rating. Solid three-star. Now let's go to The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill. This one, very fun. Uh, at first, I didn't know how to feel about it. It seemed a little too goofy, a little too humorous. But as it kept going and I really saw what they were going for, I was like, you know what? This is interesting and fun. I really enjoyed it. One of the better ones, in my opinion, they're all good to some degree, but I love how Stephen King playing a hillbilly who pokes a meteor with a stick, that just seemed particularly funny to me, plus his accent that he uses and the fact that at certain points he has like one eye crossed, I'm sure people did catch that, but he did a good job of like being a funny hillbilly, I enjoyed that, and he's just like dumb and poking a stick at a meteor, it's just, it's got great humor to it that's baked in, I really enjoy that. Now, the wacky comedy really gets ramped up in this one, which there was a little bit of that prior, but that's when it really steps up. So you don't know going forward, are they going to do this a lot more in the stories or not? But you end up finding out, obviously. It works just fine, but I do think that the wacky music that they put into this one is a bit too much. I wish they would have kind of taken that back a little bit because, you know, it it's, it's got enough wackiness and humor with what Stephen King is doing and the nature of the actual story. The music was just going too over the top, in my opinion. But it was a different time. That stuff was way more acceptable then, so I get it. I love how the space vegetation, that's what I call it, like the space grass or space vegetation. I Let's call it space grass. I love how the space grass looks and how it keeps taking over more and more. I think that's probably the best thing visually appeal a visual appeal wise in this story is how you just keep seeing that this space grass just keeps taking over more and more and more and the design of it looks really cool like it's this wonderful popping vibrant green the way it's designed to be look like grass but also look like it's pointy to a point where it's like deadly is also really cool with it like it looks menacing like how do you make grass look menacing they did it like this is how it was done so I, I like that aspect of it. And then the fact that it obviously starts taking Jordy over. The biggest issue for Jordy is how much he doubts and degrades himself. He never seeks help. Notice that. He never seeks help in this because he's afraid of what he thinks will end up happening. Not just what he, like his worst fears of what he thinks will happen to him, including when the guy is like, well, we're going to have to cut off a body part. But, and that's all in his head, but also what people are going to think of him. And that's also represented in how he keeps calling himself a lunkhead. He's very self-deprecating. He has very low self-esteem. And he's just more worried about how he appears to other people and 
you know, being caught up in his own head than actually taking care of the problem and getting help from someone, which I think some people can probably relate to that. Oh, and by the way, uh, Stephen King apparently was having an allergic reaction to all the stuff that they ended up putting on him for this story. So he ended up needing to get a lot of shots to kind of keep him from having further issues. I mean, they forged ahead. They didn't change anything. So, I mean, he's a trooper for doing that. It appears that the growth on Jordy happens as he drinks. Now, I may be wrong, but it kind of seemed like that to me. So as he consumes alcohol, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> alcohol, where am I from? <laughs> so as he consumes alcohol, the uncontrollable space grass consumes him. I think this could be a point of a meditation kind of on alco alcoholism, which, by the way, was a problem for King at, at this time in his life. He, he struggled with alcoholism for a while. And if you take note, alcohol shows up in, I think, every single one of these stories, except I, I don't think it's in the final one. But it obviously plays a very significant role, and that's because King's the one who wrote it. He's very familiar with this. And I think a lot of them end up showing these kind of meditations on the struggle of alcoholism because a lot of the people who are tied to the alcoholism are the people who end up being killed or the people who end up being bad people. So, just saying. Now, uh, I give The Lonesome Death of Jordy Virel out of five stars and half stars and play a 3.5. I did enjoy it, but I could—I just couldn't get it to the four. Now let's talk about something to tide you over. This was the one with Leslie Nielsen and Ted Danson. Uh, Richard is obviously very possessive, Leslie Nielsen's character, as he talks a few times about what is mine. That's one of the big things about him as a character, which note he was drinking in this as well. Uh, he's very hell-bent on revenge because someone is sleeping with this woman, and that's his property, basically. He makes that point numerous times. They really kind of hammer home how bad of a person he is and how possessive he is. And that plays into why he's so hell-bent on revenge. And, yeah, he's just willing to go all out, obviously. When Richard says he owns all of Comfort Point, it really lets the audience know that Harry is in a really bad spot. He's totally screwed because he can yell and yell and yell while he's buried up to his neck in sand. And nobody is going to hear him because there is nobody to hear him. Except maybe his lady, Rebecca, or as he calls her, Becky, can hear him way down the beach where she is getting the same treatment. The way Richard shows Harry what's going to happen to him with the live feed of Becky really does increase the anxiety, not just for him, but for the audience, of what's going to be coming. You know, think about that situation. If you know something terrible is going to happen to you, if you're shown that terrible thing, that's happening live to another person, that increases the fear, that increases the anxiety, that increases the dread of what's coming right at you. Because you can know you're going to die, but knowing exactly how it's going to happen, way worse. So I like the fake that, the fake, I like the fact, sorry, I'm getting tired, I, it's been a day. I like the fact that that's in the story, I really do. I love the shot of Harry's head underwater with the red glow that's behind him that kind of gradually gets brighter and larger. I think that's kind of symbolizing the um, exacerbation of him holding his breath and how he's get starting to build to that critical point where he can't hold his breath anymore and he's going to have to start taking in water and die. Uh, so I love that visual representation of, of that. It looked beautiful. It looked very, very cool. So this one drives home that revenge isn't as sweet as it seems and your actions will eventually catch up to you like they do for our killer, Richard. Really enjoyed this one. So out of five stars, half stars in play, 3.5 stars. It is a good one. Next to The Crate. Uh, seems like Henry feels alone and down in life with Billy, Adrian Barbeau's character, embarrassing him at the party and Dexter seeming like he couldn't care less about being Henry's friend anymore. You obviously see that Henry feels very downtrodden in life, that he feels ignored by everyone, that he feels kind of like he's obsolete, he's useless, he's not needed, and people just kind of step on him. Obviously, Billy does, because she keeps degrading him at this party, she's getting hammered, she's making a fool, she's making she's making a fool out of him and herself, and just creating this big spectacle, uh, and he does nothing about it, like he never stands up for himself, so... That being where he starts and then seeing where he ends the film, obviously really stepping up, going overboard with that. 
um, is, a, is a stark contrast that's very interesting. Also with this situation with his friend Dexter, who obviously is more concerned about having uh, relations with his students than being a good friend to Henry and spending time playing chess with him. That's another thing that he has a hard time stepping up and uh, talking about and addressing. The fluffy reveal, I think, is really, really good when you finally see that creature in the crate. Super awesome. Really well pulled off. Fluffy looked really good, and the blood and carnage that's tied to Fluffy is well done. You can see where Johnny would think De Dexter did something to Mike. He's disheveled, there's blood all over it, and the explanation sounds nuts. It's one of those moments of you starting to think, you know, is Dexter just seeing something, or is this really what's going on? Is there really a creature in that crate, or does this have to do with someone just losing it? Because there are these moments where you're like, uh, the crate's not there anymore, and it's back under the stairs, so maybe it never actually left, and Dexter's just like going a little bit nuts, and he's a killer. So I do like that aspect where you kind of question those things. I didn't understand at first why Henry would clean all the blood up. Like he goes and he's just cleaning up Dexter's mess basically. But then when Billy started reading the note that Henry left for, it clicked for me. And I was like, oh, this is how he changes. This is how he starts stepping up and taking care of his own problems by not directly taking care of his own problems, but letting someone like Fluffy handle it for him. Saw that perfect opportunity. He's like, I'm going to solve these issues. Henry's scheme is a way to solve his problems without him directly causing harm. He's finally turned the tide and stopped being downtrodden in his life. But it'll end up being at what cost. Things seem pretty good for him by the end. He solved the problem of Billy is gone now. He doesn't have to deal with her. He obviously hated her. Dexter is his friend again because he's holding this thing over top of his head. So they just sit down and play some chess, but Fluffy is out there, because we see at the end that Fluffy gets loose when it's in the water at the, I think it's a quarry, basically, and you see the face, and that's where they leave it, and who knows where it would go from there. Does Fluffy get out and wreak havoc on the world? Does Fluffy come after Henry? We don't know, but it'd be good to get a follow-up. So out of five stars with half stars in play, another 3.5 on this one for me. Now going into the final story, they're creeping up on you. This one I think was my favorite. It was my favorite, actually. The level of cleanliness Pratt is obsessed with is very well established very immediately. I think the visuals of how stark white the whole place is, how kind of like sterile and also futuristic it looks, and all these steps that he's kind of taken to keep things clean and wall things off, basically. Like, just kind of looking at people through that peephole and that little speaker you know, having that uh, little area where he can put all his tissues and everything in and it'll, it pushes the button and it sucks it down. You know, everything has been simplified so there aren't places where these cockroaches can hide and where he can easily clean things and stay in a very sterile, clean, white environment. And I said that intentionally for a reason coming up. Pratt is so focused on his co Sorry. Pratt is so... <laughs> focused on his cockroach problem that every person he talks to can't shift his focus away from it no matter what they're saying you know they had that situation where one of his uh employees is dead i think he had killed himself and he's speaking to the wife who's blaming him for it and it's like he's only partially listening like he can't fully focus because he keeps going back to I, I have this bug problem i have this bug problem so you not only see where his priorities are and how it's all about himself especially in those little moments where he kind of gets pulled into the conversations a little bit, but the fact that it's, it's, it's an obsession at this point. It's something that his mind can't let go of, that there are these bugs there. But I question, with the way that it's shot, and if you really pay attention, I question if there are even bugs there. I would say there probably are not. Because the way it's shot, if you look, there are times where the bugs are there and it looks like they're physically there. I mean, they were physically there on the set, but from a film standpoint, story standpoint, it looks like they're supposed to be physically there. And then these quick moments where something, it, it was there, but then it's not there. So it gives you the idea it's, it's kind of all in his head. The scale of the roach infestation in this is very impressive. I was not expecting to see that many roaches, but kudos for going that far. That's why it was very expensive at 50 cents a roach. 
And then the finale with them all coming out of Pratt, just wow on that. I love that part. That is my fav favorite part, I think, of the entire movie, is when all of them just start getting pumped out of his body. <sighs> Can you imagine the cleanup on that set with all those cockroaches? Ooh, who's the cockroach wrangler? Go get him. <laughs> this really drives home uh, a little bit of humans versus nature and how people try to create their own tightly controlled environment free of any unpredictable elements, both nature-wise and society-wise. And I add in society-wise there because there is a racist element to what Upson Pratt is saying and doing and how he's acting. It's this whole thing of him kind of looking out at the city and not wanting the elements from the city, the bad elements from the city getting in. And then you see the racism further when he's talking to the gentleman who comes to his door, who he's talking to through the speaker and the uh, peephole. And he even says, he's like, oh, that's probably, a, you're probably good at that type of job. You know, you're kind, you colored people. I mean, obviously something a racist says. So they, it's in there intentionally, obviously he is racist. And that's why he's living in a very stark white room, keeping himself walled off. He is an extreme racist. And he's very much afraid of the outside undesirable element getting in, which is what he views as cockroaches, basically. He views minorities as cockroaches in this, is how I, I see it. And there's a lot, of, a lot to support that, as I just kind of laid out. But there is also this nature aspect to it, where if you think about it, in your home, we're trying to keep insects out of the house. And it's just, it's so hard to do that. Insects are always going to get in one way or another, you know, even as fast as just opening the, the front door, like something can fly in. But we try so hard to either kill them or throw them back outside. I'm one of the people who throws them back outside. Um, we try so hard to do that because we want to keep ourselves separated from nature because we have our own reality and then there's that outside reality of nature. And that works both ways in this, in this film or this particular story where he's doing that from a nature standpoint to keep the bugs out and to keep nature out, but he's also doing it to keep a part of society out, or even all of society at this point. So I just thought the, those were some interesting things that ended up coming up. Uh, this also gets to the racist element. Oh, okay, I already talked about that, so that's actually done. Um, really enjoyed this one. Like I said, this was my favorite one. I, I liked them all, but this one's my favorite. So out of five stars, half stars in play four star rating on this particular story, which leads me to what am I giving to this entire film? Four stars. I mean, the, I had one at three, I had the majority at 3.5, and then I had the one at four. But when you put it all together, it's a very solid four. I thought about maybe going a 4.5, but I don't think it quite reaches that level for me. Four stars. It's a very good film. I really enjoy it. So some things to just kind of wrap up at the end. The voodoo doll finish, I thought to this, was was fun with the, the wraparound story. Uh, also really liked the the garbage men who Tom Savini played one of them, pulling the, the uh, comic out of the garbage and reading through it, just showing that there are people out there who just love it. They, they love these horror comics, and if the kid's not going to be able to have it, these garbage men are going to enjoy it, so I love that. And then the fact that they're looking through and the coupon for the voodoo doll is missing, awesome. Because then you see the kid has gotten the voodoo doll and he's using it to take care of Stan, his father. Because he hates horror and comics. The comic book aspects of this film worked really well and it keeps it very playful and interesting from a film perspective. It also gives this kind of charm to it. Now I'm talking about the integration as far as the animation in the beginning, also how they use those um, cells They'll like move like an actual comic book from uh, scene to scene at times, which is really, really cool way to integrate the comic book into it. And then the colors too. Uh, the colors and especially those high creep, high scare moments where they have like bright colors in the background with some shapes uh, that is something you would end up seeing in a comic book. So I love the way they integrated that. And the colors just look really cool in general in those moments. Uh, notice that alcohol consumption is in every story except the final one. Yeah, because King had a drinking problem. I'm assuming there's a tie into that. He's talked a lot about, you know, having, being very, obviously feeling very bad about his time being an alcoholic, especially the impact that it had on his family. And for 
partially for that reason. He writes a lot about family dynamics and the bad aspects and hurtful aspects of family dynamics, which you see a lot of that in the stories within this film. Uh, obviously not in the final story, but a bunch of the other ones. You know, Father's Day, obviously their family dynamics there. Uh, the crate there are with specifically um, Henry and Billy, that aspect of family dynamics, uh, the, um, something that tied you over with, you know, breaking of trust within family dynamics because of, uh, Leslie Nielsen's character, Richard and Rebecca, and the fact that she has, you know, cheated on him. So yeah, you know, that type of stuff. But, um, yeah, really enjoyed this. I'm glad I finally saw it. This, I'm sorry, this is a long review, but, uh, put some comments down there. I want to know everything you think about, well, not everything, but Important things you think about Creep Show. How do you feel about this film? Do you love it more than I do? Do you love it less than I do? Let's talk about that. And also, if you have particular stories in there you really want to comment on, go ahead and do that. Let's get nerdy. Uh, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done. It is quick. It is painless. It costs you zero money. And it helps motivate me to keep doing stuff like this. Because I just sat down and talked for like a 30 minutes straight. I don't cut this video up. I don't do it. It's all in one take, so I'm getting exhausted. So at least just for that, give me that subscribe. Uh, it really does keep me motivated. But regardless, I really do thank you for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.